Yeah, I'll react to that, sure. Okay, do I have shaving cream on my face? Hey guys, my name's Connor. If you knew the original link to the video, top of the description, right below that link to the Discord, I'll be your captain this evening. Sorry. What? Let's learn, shall we? Preemptive like, why the invasion of Italy almost failed. I know very little about what happened. I thought... D-Day in Normandy was the first foothold the Allies had in Europe, but apparently Lower Italy had been invaded before that, so I don't know as much about the invasion of Italy as I would like. Let's learn. In July of 1943, British, American, and Canadian troops had landed on the beaches of Sicily and were beginning to fight their way inland. But there was a problem. More than two weeks into the operation, the Allied leaders had failed to decide what they would do next. The Americans wanted to take the most direct route into the Third Reich via France, but the British wanted more time to build their forces. The debate was fierce, but on the 25th of July 1943, everything changed. The fascist Grand Council in Italy deposed the dictator Benito Mussolini. His successor, Marshal Badoglio, began secret peace negotiations with the Allies. Now, the Allies plan to take advantage of this coup and knock Italy out of the war by an invasion of the Italian mainland. The invasion was supposed to be a simple one, capitalizing on a wavering Italy and a distracted Germany. But the reality was very different. In this second episode of our series i saw a video of what they did to mussolini when they caught him and it wasn't pleasant it was kind of uh the opposite sponsored pleasant. by company of heroes 3 don't look it up we'll be examining the allied invasion Unless, of italy and just how close it came to catastrophe With secret Italian peace negotiations underway, it was vital that the Allies took the initiative in Italy before the Germans had a chance to take control for themselves. Sense. Planning was frantic, but as the fighting in Sicily drew to a close, the operation began to take shape. The invasion was two pronged. First, troops of Bernard Montgomery's 8th Army would land on the toe of Italy at Reggio di Calabria in Operation Baytown. They would attempt to tie down the Axis forces who had escaped to cross the Straits just weeks before. Then, troops of Mark Clark's 5th Army would land at Salerno in Operation Avalanche. They would capture Naples and the airfields at Foggia to cut off any Axis escape. This would coincide with the announcement of the armistice and would be accompanied by an American airborne landing near Rome to help Italian forces to defend. It's like we're... Like, this is the first time... When it comes to the Pacific... Um, you know, um, fighting the Jap Americans, fighting the Japanese, or obviously the Allies pushing east from France after the invasion, and stuff uh, like Stalingrad Grad and different battles in the east. I've, I, I at least sort of heard of that stuff. This is the first time I am ever looking at any battle scenarios in Italy. And it's it reminds me of, um, like, I, I've seen videos on Hannibal, in this area of the world uh, prior to seeing anything World War II in Southern Italy. And I just think it's, what's the word? Funny, no, fascinating. Inter it's cool how more than 2,000 years earlier, Hannibal was fighting the Romans. Anyway, sorry, City. let's go. Airborne landing near Rome to help Italian forces to defend their city. If everything went to plan, the Italians would be able to delay the Germans, allowing the Allies to take the south of the country with limited interference. It seemed that a short campaign was within their grasp. On the 3rd of September 1943, Marshal Badoglio signed the secret armistice with the Allies. The Italians were out of the war. On the same day, Montgomery's men embarked for the invasion, but their landings would not unfold as planned. The landings at Reggio di Calabria were straightforward. The distance across the Strait of Messina was only three miles, so the troops could cross on landing craft without the need to disembark from naval vessels. The aim of those landings was to tie down Axis forces and stop them from retreating further north. But, as General Montgomery had predicted, the landing did not provoke a German counterattack. 
Instead, Field Marshal Kesselring instructed his subordinate, General Hare, to conduct a fighting retreat, impeding the British advance with the use of Worst mines earth. and the destruction of bridges. The sense. Germans were well prepared for the Allied landings. While a small force slowed Montgomery's advance, Kesselring concentrated the bulk of his troops to the north near Naples, where he expected the main Allied attack to fall. He had orders to delay any landing before falling back to a defensive line north of Rome. They were also prepared for an Italian armistice. Though Marshal Badoglio publicly proclaimed that Italy would continue fighting for the Axis, Adolf Hitler was skeptical. He had devised Operation. It's interesting. I'm kind of just noticing this. All of the big Italian cities that you think of are on the west coast. Well, not Venice, I guess. Sorry. Armistice. Right. Though Marshal Badoglio publicly proclaimed that Italy would continue fighting for the Axis, Adolf Hitler was skeptical. He had devised Operation Axer, which would use Erwin Rommel's Army Group B alongside Kesselring's forces to seize Italian territory and neutralize its army should they defect. The Italians were expecting the armistice to be announced on September 12th, giving them time to prepare a defense of Rome. Instead, they learned that Eisenhower planned to make the announcement on September 8th. Badoglio begged for more time, but with landing craft already en route to Salerno, the Allied Supreme Commander refused. On the evening of the 8th, the announcement was made, but the botched execution would have terrible consequences. The American airborne landings in Rome were abandoned, while an additional landing at Taranto, codenamed Operation Slapstick, was hurriedly put together. Meanwhile, German troops moved in to disarm the Italians. The Italian surrender was a complete shock to the officers who commanded Italian troops. The Italian forces defending Rome were substantial, and there was an attempt to defend the city from the German assault. But this was undermined by the flight of Marshal Badoglio and King Victor Emmanuel from the city. The confusion that reigned in the Italian armed forces assisted the well-executed German plan that saw hundreds of thousands of Italians taken into captivity. The swift action by the Germans dashed the Allied hope of a quick victory. In the following days, the Germans would set up a puppet state in the parts of Italy they still controlled and break Mussolini out of prison to run it. At the same time, Allied troops embarked their landing craft for Italy. At Taranto, the landings faced almost no resistance, and the British paratroopers quickly took control of the town and its port. But the troops at Salerno were in for the fight of their lives. Their commander, Mark Clark, believed he could achieve tactical surprise and chose not to employ a preliminary naval bombardment. But he was wrong. As the first wave of troops approached the beaches, a German loudspeaker sparked into life and proclaimed, come on in and give up. We have you covered. The bloody battle of Salerno was about to begin. At 3.30 a.m., the British and American troops hit the beaches of Salerno. But as they waded ashore, fire from the 16th Panzer Division in the hills above Salerno rained down onto the beaches, causing mayhem and confusion. On the left, US Rangers took the mountain passes leading to Naples with minimal resistance, and British commandos fought hard for a foothold in Salerno itself. Meanwhile, British 10th Corps in the centre and US 9th Corps on the right managed to secure a small beachhead, but were ominously split in two. As they attempted to advance inland, the Allied troops then came under attack from German tanks. In the face of the German armoured onslaught, British infantrymen had to rely on weapons such as the Piat, which stands for the Projector Infantry Anti-Tank. The Piat was designed to provide infantry with a readily portable weapon capable of stopping a tank. RPG. The range of the Piat was rather short, so it required infantrymen to come perilously close to the tank for the chance of an effective strike. At the Etri Sul Mare, three miles west of Salerno, two commando were able to stop a Tiger tank after multiple hits with their pit. The Allied soldiers were under severe pressure as they fought to stabilize defensive lines. 
Overnight, new German units arrived from the north and stopped the British from capturing the town of Battipaglia the following day. They also denied the use of Monte Corvino airfield to the Allies, which restricted their air support. But in the south, German units ran out of fuel and failed to arrive in time. As a result, the US forces expanded their beachhead and closed the gap between themselves and the uh, uh, Stay hydrated, guys. Sorry, just let, let, let me... ...from capturing the town of Battipaglia the following day. They also denied the use of Monte Corvino airfield to the Allies, which restricted their air support. But in the south, German units ran out of fuel and failed to arrive in time. As a result, the US forces expanded their beachhead and closed the gap between themselves and the British. All the time, Montgomery's units were advancing at a snail's pace through the toe and boot of Italy. Offshore, the Luftwaffe mounted over 550 sorties in the first three days of the invasion. Their targets, however, were not the Allied troops landing in force, but the ships in Salerno Bay, which were finally unleashing their huge firepower against the German defenders. The Germans did have one answer to the massive Allied firepower that sat in Salerno Bay. Throughout September, they repeatedly deployed the world's first precision-guided weapon, the Fritz X. The Fritz X was specifically like designed tomahawk? to target cruisers and battleships. The bomb was guided by a radio control link, which sent signals to the spoilers in the tail fins. The operator had to keep the munition in sight, whilst the pilot of the aircraft had to maintain course. On the 11th of September 1943, the American light cruiser, the USS Savannah, was hit by a Fritz X, which passed through the roof of a gun turret. The bomb exploded in in the lower ammunition handling room, 197 United States sailors were killed and 15 severely wounded in the attack. After four days of fierce fighting, the situation was becoming more and more precarious. The beachhead. I feel like so much, uh, I could be wrong here, but a lot of the great technology from World War II seemed to come from either the British or the Germans. And imagine if they were on the same side. That'd be crazy. I feel like the Soviets and the Americans were more of just the... Well, Soviets, mainly the men, and just the output. And Americans, the, the industrial output. The Soviets, the men, and the industrial output. And then the British... Do you know what I'm trying to say that I can't say right the British and Germans seem to have the kind of intelligence. Help me out here. What am I trying to say? Does anyone know what I'm trying to say? The cool, like the weapons, I forget it. Was still shat the situation was becoming more and more precarious. The beachhead was still shallow and the Germans were seemingly reinforcing faster. Oh, uh, were killed, and f that looks like a modern like, tomahawk missile. Fifteen severely wounded in the attack. After four days of fierce fighting, the situation Atomic was becoming scientists. more and more precarious. The beachhead was still shallow, and the Germans were seemingly reinforcing faster than the Allies. Things would only get worse. With Montgomery's men still miles away, Kesselring managed to concentrate the elements of six German divisions, ready for a massive counterattack. As the 13th of September arrived, they were poised to drive downhill, straight in between the British and American forces. The German units were highly mobile, with tanks and armoured vehicles. They quickly concentrated and identified weak points in the Allied line. They exploited those holes before regrouping and concentrating to attack in a different direction. The attacks were costly for the Germans. The 16th Panzer Division's attack in the centre caused the loss of more than half of its tanks. Still, by the night of the 13th of September, the Germans appeared to be on the brink of victory as they threatened to split the Allied beachhead in two. As dawn broke on the 14th of September, the mood was gloomy. All unloading was ceased as supply men joined the combat troops in digging in for a final stand. Meanwhile, initial preparations were made to evacuate the beachhead. 
If the only good news was the arrival of vital reinforcements in the form of the 82nd Airborne Division, whose landing near Rome had been cancelled days before. At 8am, the Germans attacked again, having received yet more reinforcements. But this time, the Allies held. Devastating supporting fires from naval guns in Salerno Bay proved pivotal, and scores of German tanks were destroyed. By the end of the day, evacuation plans were out the window. The Allies were here to stay. After the war, Kesselring stated that with two more panzer divisions transferred from Rommel's Army Group B, his forces could have defeated the Allies at Salerno. Instead, after a few more attacks, the German forces began to withdraw northwards, and the Allies finally began to pour supplies into Salerno. On September 20th, 5th Army finally linked up with the 8th Army, and together they began their pursuit. For their next objectives, Naples and Foggia, the Allies were expecting an even even tougher fight, but they were in for another surprise. In the days following the Allied landing at Salerno, a febrile atmosphere had been brewing in Naples when an announcement was made that all men of working age would be rounded up for deportation to work camps in either northern Italy or Germany. The refusal to comply with this order surged into a civilian uprising. Their efforts prevented the Germans from organising a defence of the city, but the consequences were severe. As the Germans withdrew from the city, they perpetrated acts of destruction such as burning the university library and the state archives. The Germans also planted explosive devices with time delays, shattered water, gas and electricity supplies, wrecked sanitation and a major food shortage greeted the Allies when they liberated the city on the 1st of October. On the same day, 8th Army found Foggia abandoned. The Germans had changed their strategy. Adolf Hitler had obviously killing people is more horrific than burning information, but there's something about burning information and books and libraries that is just like a, a it's not as gruesome, but it, it's like you're you're making it bad for everyone in the future being able to learn things. And so when stuff like that happens, again, it, it, you have to like comparing it to people being killed. But do you know what I mean? Like, there's a level of... Uh, I, just, I can't speak words today. Jesus. What, what am I looking for? There... Like, were they doing it to destroy records or just, like... My... <laughs> I, this is the first video I'm doing today, and my vocabulary is isn't great all anyways, and so it's even worse now. But th there's there's an other level of just animosity I get towards people who who kind of destroy records and and information for the sake of like pissing people off, and obviously it doesn't you know initially decreed that the Germans should only defend northern Italy, but after the defence of Salerno, he was persuaded that the mountainous terrain of central Italy would favour defensive fighting. Now Kesselring, given command of all German forces in Italy, planned for a fighting withdrawal across a series of defensive fortifications, culminating in the fearsome Gustav Line. There, he would hold the Allies for as long as possible. The Germans slowed the British advance by laying numerous mines. The most famous was the S-mine, or Bouncing Betty as the oh, Americans it. Shoot up and then when sh triggered, a propellant charge sent the mine upwards to about chest height. Oh. Then the main charge detonated, and the material inside became shrapnel, spraying horizontally, maiming or killing anyone in the area. The safest response was to drop to the ground as quickly as possible. These mines became emblematic of the static attritional warfare that was to follow. The Allies now controlled southern Italy. The Isn't that kind of the same concept behind, like, when they set off the Hiroshima and Nagasaki bombs? That they, they exploded them, like, kind of in the air to give the maximum amount of destruction rather than just on the ground? Is it the same concept, or am I... 
comparing two things that aren't that was to follow comparable. The Allies now controlled southern Italy. The fighting had been costly, over 12,500 Allied casualties to this point, with the Germans suffering just over a quarter of that number. Ahead of them lay even tougher German defences, and autumn rains turning the ground into a quagmire. But as the Allied soldiers fought the mud, their commanders were grappling with a new question. How much further should the Allies go? Whichever answer they chose, one thing was clear. The supposedly soft underbelly of Europe had turned out to be one tough old gut. I remember, isn't it Churchill that, that said that line? That's like the soft underbelly of Europe. Um, it was clear. It's an interesting video, guys. I'd appreciate any comments as always. Um, In the ground and to a... You know, like the old, the World War One tanks. I think it was like the Mark One, or that the tread is is open to the air, like it doesn't have this covering on it. And so, in this scenario where it's super muddy, and you know, the treads are going to be better probably in this condition than wheels are, but still, if 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 they didn't obstruct here, wouldn't it be a good idea to like attach not like have these little notches on the treads? And like these steel uh, spikes that you could like attach on them in these bad scenarios. Like you, you could put like, so here's the top of the tread, right? And like you put the spikes here. And so when they go down, they have more traction that they can pull you out. And then when you get out of that scenario, you can just take them off and it keeps going. I don't know. I just, I thought of it. Maybe it's not a great idea. I uh, love y'all. Hope you guys are all doing well. And uh, hopefully I'll see you next video. Bye, guys.